The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to lecture number six. In this lecture, I would like to discuss with you the formulation and calculation of isoparametric finite elements. We considered earlier already, in lecture four, the uh, calculation of finite element matrices. But in that lecture, we considered the generalized coordinate finite element models. The generalized coordinate finite element models were the first finite elements derived. However, I now want to discuss with you a more general approach of deriving the required interpolation matrices and element matrices. And this more general approach is the isoparametric finite element derivation. The isoparametric finite elements that I will be discussing in this and the next lecture are, in my opinion, the most effective elements currently available for plane stress, plane strain, axisymmetric analysis, three-dimensional analysis, thick and thin shell analysis. These elements are being used, for example, in the computer program Adena. They are also used in other computer programs and represent a modern approach to the solution of structural problems. In this lecture, I like to talk about the derivation of continuum elements. In the next lecture, we will talk about the derivation of structural elements, thin and uh, thin shell elements, beam elements. The basic concept of isoparametric finite element analysis is that we interpolate the geometry of an element and the displacements of an element in exactly the same way. Let us look at the geometry interpolation. Here you see for three-dimensional analysis the interpolation of the x coordinates within the element where we use the interpolation functions hi. Of course, these interpolation functions are unknown, and I will have to show you how we derive them for certain elements. The xi are the nodal point coordinates. Uh, these xi, the xi value for i equals 1, for example, is nothing else than the coordinate, the x coordinate of nodal point 1 and so on. So the xi are the nodal point coordinates for all nodes. They are given, they are input in the analysis the way we have been discussing it in the previous lecture. And if we know the hi, we have a direct relationship for the x coordinates within the element as a function of the nodal point coordinates. Again, I have to show you how we obtain the hi functions for the various elements that we are using. Similarly for the y interpolation and similarly for the z interpolation. The having derived the hi functions we are using in the isoparametric finite element the same functions also to interpolate the displacements. Notice that we are having here the nodal point displacements ui, vi, and wi. And here we have the same interpolation functions that we already used in the coordinate interpolations. n is the number of nodes that are used in the description of the element. And in fact, we will see that n can be available. It can be equal to 3, 4, 5, up to uh, a large number of nodes uh, and in practice, we generally don't go much further than 16. I mentioned that I want to discuss in this, in this lecture continuum elements. Well, the continuum elements that we are addressing ourselves to are the truss element, the 2D elements, plane stress, plane strain, and axisymmetric elements, and then the 3D elements for three-dimensional and six-shell analysis. 
These are continuum elements. We call them continuum elements because we only use u, here of course u and v, and here u, v, and w, the displacements to describe the internal element displacements. We are only using the nodal point displacements u, u, v, and u, v, w for all of the nodal points to describe the internal element displacements. Structural elements, on the other hand, also use the rotations at the nodal point, theta x, theta y, and theta z, in order to describe the deformations within the element. And I will be discussing structural elements in the next lecture. So for the moment, we do not have any rotations at the nodes, or what we will allow are u, v, and w displacements at the nodes. Typical examples, for example, are given on this view graph. These are elements that are available in the computer program Adena. Uh, here we have a truss element, a two-noded truss element. The only displacement of interest in the truss, of course, is the actual displacement here. Here we have a three-noded truss or cable element. Here we have a set of two-dimensional elements. Notice we have triangular elements here, a triangular element here. We have here an eight-node element that is curved. We can construct curved elements in the isoparametric approach. And here we have a rectangular eight-node element, straight sides, in other words. These elements are used in plane stress, plane strain, and axisymmetric analysis. Uh, in three-dimensional analysis, we might be talking about, we might be using such elements. This is the eight-node brick. Of course, each node now has three displacements, u, v, and w. This is here a higher order element, where we have, in addition to the corner nodes, we also have mid-side nodes. We don't need to have mid-side nodes along all sides. For example, here, I did not put a mid-side node as an example. In fact, we could simply have mid-side nodes here and no mid-side nodes anywhere else. I will show you how we construct these interpolation matrices uh, in uh, the next few minutes. Let us uh, consider, as a very simple example, a special case. And the special case that I like to look at is a truss element which is two units long. In other words, the length from here to there is equal to 1. And similarly, the length from here to there is also equal to 1. I am putting, I'm describing the element with a coordinate r that I set equal to 0 at the midpoint of the element plus 1 at the right end and minus 1 at the left end. This is a special geometry. And of course, we will later on have to generalize our approach to more general geometries where the length is not equal to 2 and the element might even be curved. But for instructive purposes, let's look at this geometry first. Similarly, for two-dimensional analysis, I want to look at an element that has lengths to this direction and lengths to that direction. In other words, a generalization of the uh, concept that we just looked at for the truss. Now we have two dimensions, and in each dimension we have a length of two. I embed into this element an RS coordinate system. And this coordinate system now has its origin, of course, here at r equals 0 and s equals 0. The r axis bisects this side, and the s axis bisects this side. This side. Notice that this is a coordinate system that is embedded into the element. We also call that the natural, the natural coordinate system, or the isoparametric coordinate system. This element, 2 by 2, of course, would lie in space uh, in an xy coordinate system, as indicated here. Now, for three-dimensional analysis, we would proceed in the same way. Then we would, of course, consider an element that is 
2 by 2 by 2 units long into each coordinate direction. And then we would have an RS axis and a T axis coming out of the transparency uh, in this particular case. Well, I want to look at the truss element, the special truss element, and the special 2D element. And I want to show you how we can construct the interpolation matrices, the displacement interpolation matrices HI. Of course, these are also the coordinate interpolation matrices. I want to show you how we construct them for these special elements, how we then can calculate the strain displacement interpolation matrices for these special elements. And then I want to go on and show you how we generalize the concepts to curved elements and once we have discussed the two-dimensional case, I think you can see yourself how the concepts are generalized to the three-dimensional case. Let's look then at our two nodal truss first. Here we have once more the truss. And we have node 1 on the right-hand side, node 2 on the left-hand side. Our R coordinate system starts in the middle of the truss. Notice. What we want to obtain is that we interpolate our U displacement via the interpolations U being equal to HI times UI. The HI are the unknowns. I want to show you how we obtain the HI. The UI are the nodal point displacements. In this particular case, there would be here U2, and here we would have U1. I, in other words, goes from 1 to 2 for this particular case. The hi has to be a function of r. For a given r, however, for a given r, we can evaluate the u displacement if we have ui's given. In other words, when u1 and u2 are given, then for a given r, we can evaluate directly from this relation the displacement at that point r. Well, with two nodes, we can only have a by only a linear representation in the displacements. The h1 from this relation must be this function because if we look at this and we say let u2 be equal to 0, we would simply have that u is equal to h1 u1. Well, therefore, our h1 must look this one because u1 has its full strength here. If we put u1 equal to 1, we would have u is equal to h1, and this would be the variation. Similarly, for h2, in this case, we would have u is equal to h2 u2. h1 is now equal to 0. If we put u2 equal to 1, as I have done in this particular case, then our linear variation is indicated as shown here. And the function, of course, h2 is given right here. Notice that h2 is equal to 0 when r is equal to 1. And h2 is equal to 1 when r is equal to minus 1. So this gives us h2. The two nodal truss, therefore, simply has this description here for the displacements and the coordinates. Remember that we are using the same hi for displacements and coordinates. It simply has this description where h1 and h2 are defined as shown. Let us now say that we want to add another node, that we want to put another node right there. In other words, we want to go from a two-noded description to a three-noded description. On one of the earlier view graphs, you could see a three-noded cable element. Well. The way we proceed in the construction of the hi functions is as follows. The two-noded element simply had this description here. h1 is given as shown here on the left side of the blue line. h2 was simply this. And we knew that we could do no better than a linear description in displacements between two nodes. However, now we have a third node right here. And a third node means that we can use a parabolic description. 
in displacements. Now H3 must be equal to 1 at the third node and 0 at both sides. Why? Well, because remember we have u now equal to hi, ui, where i equal 1 to 3. And if we put u1 equal to 0 and u2 equal to 0, we simply have u equals h3, u3, and therefore h3 is this function. And we have, I've written it down here. When r is equal to 0, it's 1. When r is equal to minus 1 or plus 1, h3 is 0. Well, so this is our h3. However, if we now look back to our earlier description of h1 and h2 for the two-noded element, we remember that we had a linear variation here, that we had a linear variation here and here. This one was the linear vari variation of h1. Let me take here the green color to show once more what we are talking about. That was our linear variation. And here, this one here was our linear variation there. Well, now with the third node there, we recognize that at this third node, our h2, our actual h2 for the three-noded truss must be 0 here. It must be 0 here. h1 must be 0 here. Well, how can we make it 0 here? We can make it 0 by subtracting from our two-noded truss h1 one half of this parabolic description. And that's what I have done here. Similarly, we have to subtract it here. Because then what we are doing is we are taking one half of this parabola and we are putting it right on here. This is one half of the bottom parabola. We are putting it on there. And that brings this point back to that point. Remember, this is equal to 1. I want one half as a correction here. And that's why I take one half of 1 minus r squared to bring this point back to there. This total description then, this total part, this part here, all of that together is our h1 for the three-noded element, for the three-noded element. And similarly, of course, we would have for h2, this total part here is this function here for our three-noded element. Now, the important point that I really like you to understand is that we have started off with a two-noded element description, h1 only the linear part, h2 only the linear part. We have constructed the interpolation function for the third node, and then we have corrected the earlier two-noded interpolation functions via subtracting a certain part of the third interpolation function in order to obtain the new h1 and h2 for the three-noded element. And this is indeed the actual procedure that we can use very effectively in constructing higher order elements. We are starting off with the lower order element descriptions, the one once shown here dashed with a dashed line, the linear part only. And we add in the higher order description and subtract the, a correction from the lower order description. The, cor the correction has to be subtracted to bring this point back to 0, because h1 total must now be equal to 0 here. h2 total must be equal to 0 here. And this way, we have constructed our new h1 and h2 for the three-noded truss element. Let's look at the four-noded element in two dimensions now. Here we use very similar concepts. These are the four nodes for the element. The description along the side is just like we have been discussing now for the truss, linear here and linear here. Notice h1 can directly be written down. It has to be equal to 1 here and 0 everywhere else. This is a function which is bilinear and which 
satisfies the, these conditions to be equal to 1 here and 0 at the other nodes. It is a linear variation along this side, along this side, and also across the surface. In other words, for a given value, for a given value of R, we have a linear variation across here too. How do we obtain H2? Well, we simply have to change signs, the signs of here, the plus signs here, in an appropriate way. Uh, H2 shall be equal to 1 here, 0 at all the other nodes. Well, we see that this function satisfies these conditions. Let's put in R equal to minus 1. That makes this 2. Divided by 4 gives us 1 half. S has to be equal to plus 1 at this point. We get another 2 in here. So H2 is equal to 1 right there. And it's 0 everywhere else. Similarly, we construct H3 and H4. Indeed, we can immediately observe that these signs plus, in both cases here, a minus here, plus there, minus, minus, plus, minus, these signs correspond to nothing else than the signs of the R and S coordinates of the nodal point under consideration. R and S is plus here. We have two plus signs here. R is negative here. We put a negative sign here. But S is positive here. We put a plus sign there. R and S both are negative here. So we have two negative signs here, etc. Let us now con see how we construct from this basic four-node element, which really corresponds to our basic two-node element in the case of the truss, how we can construct higher-order elements. Well. We proceed in much the same way as in the truss formulation. Here we have a four-noded basic element, and we have added a fifth node to it. Now, let's look at this in detail. Since we now have added a fifth node here, we know that we can allow a parabolic distribution. In fact, we should allow a parabolic distribution of displacements along this side. Well, if it's a parabola along this side, for s being plus 1, we immediately see that this function here, with s equal to plus 1, this is equal to 2, knocks out that 1 half. We have a 1 minus r squared along the side, just the same function that we already had in the truss. Well, along this direction, we can only vary things linearly because we have two nodes only along these directions. And this, why, this is the reason why we have to put in a 1 plus s here. The linear variation is given by 1 plus s, and we also notice that when s is equal to minus 1, in other words, we are looking at this side, this function is 0. When s is equal to plus 1, as we pointed out earlier, this function here, this part and that part, uh, gives us a 1 together, and we have simply a 1 minus r squared along here. So here you can see these triangles that show the linear variation along this side. Of course, these parabolas here run really across here, but with a different intensity. The intensity of the parabola goes down linearly from 1 at this end to 0 at that end. This is our H5. Well, if we have this as our H5, we remember, of course, that our original H1 of the two of the four-noded element had a linear variation along here, and of course also a linear variation along here. We will now have to take this H1 and subtract some correction from it in order to make this point here have a zero displacement uh, for H1. Well, what we will do is we take this H5 and subtract a multiple of h5 from h1. In fact, you can see since h, the original h1 is equal to 1 half here, we simply have to subtract 1 half of this function to obtain the new h1. And this is what I have done on this view graph. The h1 now is the original h1 that we had. And we are subtracting 1 half of h5, which is 1 half of the parabolic distribution to bring this point here down to 0 in displacements. And that's what we have done here. The resulting function then is shown uh, here. 
And of course, our H1 now for the 5 noted element is shown right here. Similarly, for H2, this is the H2 function for the 5 noted element. Interesting to note that H3 and H4 are for the 5 noted element the same as for the 4 noted element because this fifth node lies between nodes 1 and 2 and there is no effect along this side and along this side here, along that side for uh, H3 and H4. So we have our original functions uh, also for the five-noded element. Let us look now at a generalization of this concept. Here we have a typical uh, nine-noded element, a very effective element for many types of applications. I already show it here in its curved form, but think of it, please, as follows. This is the s-axis, this is the r-axis, s is equal to zero along this side, s is equal to plus one along this side, s is equal to minus one along this side, r is equal to plus one along this side, r is equal to minus one along this side, and r is zero along this axis. So in the RS description, in the embedded coordinate system, this element is still a 2 by 2 square element. Uh, well, if we look then at the interpolation functions, uh, for this element, they look as follows. Now, maybe you have difficulty seeing all of this information, so uh, please then refer to the study guide where you find this uh, view graph. For the four-noded element, we had these interpolation functions. If we want to deal with a five-noded element, what we have to do is we add this interpolation function and, as I pointed out earlier, we have to correct our h1 and h2. But that is all of the correction that is required h3 and h4 are not corrected. There are blank spots here. There are blank spots here. So our five-noted element would have these interpolation functions now shown in red. For if we added a sixth node, and I now should go back to our earlier picture, if I wanted to add, in addition to the fifth node, also the sixth node, well, then I have to put another interpolation function down here, which now is parabolic in S and linear in R, and I have to correct H2 and H3 again. These are the corrections. So now I have in green here shown to you the interpolation functions of a six-noded element. And like that, we can proceed by adding interpolation functions and correcting the earlier constructed interpolation functions as shown. Like that, we can proceed to directly obtain the interpolation functions for the five-noted, six-noted, seven, eight, and nine-noted element. In fact, it's also important to notice that we could have this node, that node, this node, and that node, and just H9 also added. We could have, in other words, a five-noded element which looks like this. It has this node, that one, that one, and that one, and that one in the middle. Another five-noded element would be this one, this one, this one, this one, with that node in there. So there is no necessity in having all the nodes below a certain number. But we can simply use four nodes and then add whichever nodes we want to have into the element. Uh, this is then how we construct the interpolation functions. And of course, once we have the HI, we directly can obtain the H matrix, the matrix that gives the displacements in terms of the nodal point displacements. Of course, notice that the H matrix really is constructed from the HIs. And the elements of the B matrix, the strain displacement interpolation matrix, are the derivatives of the HI, or 0 
and I will show you an example right now. Because we are using for, we are still looking at the special case of a two by two by two element in a truss case, only this two, plane stress, plane strain, axis symmetric, two dimensional analysis, we have these two twos, in other words, we are talking about a two by two element, and in three dimensional analysis we would talk about a two by two by two element. In these cases we have x equal to r, y equal to s, z equal to t, so the strains which are of course derivatives with respect to x, the actual physical coordinates, can also directly be obtained by simply taking the derivatives with respect to r and then similarly for s and t. Uh, let us look at a four-node two-dimensional element. Uh, this is really the element that we have used in our earlier example of the cantilever analysis. Uh, here we would simply have that u r s v r s are described as shown. Uh, the notice that in the first row we are really saying nothing else than u is the summation of h i u i, where i equals 1 to 4 because we have a four noted element. Excuse me, h i u i. In the second row we are really saying nothing else than v being the summation of i equals 1 to 4 h i v i and all I have done is I have taken these h i's and assembled them into a matrix form to obtain our h matrix. Uh, of course this h matrix here, the entries in that h matrix are dependent on the ordering that you're using here for u1, v1, u2, etc. With this ordering these are the entries. Notice there are zeros here because the v degrees of freedom at the nodes have no contribution, of course, to the U displacement in the element. Well, if we look at the plane stress case uh, and want to construct our B matrix, remember the B matrix gives the strains in terms of the nodal point displacements. And we remember also that our epsilon xx is equal to del U del x our epsilon yy is equal to del v del y and our gamma xy is equal to del u del y plus del v del x. Well, if we recognize these facts and we also note again, of course, that for the 2 by 2 element r is identical to x, s is identical to y, then we can obtain the epsilon rr or epsilon xx by simply taking the derivatives by simply taking the derivatives of the hi's with respect to r. Notice here, since u is equal to the summation of hi ui, del u del r, which is equal to del u del x, is nothing else than the summation of partial hi uh, del r u i. And this part, of course, which runs from 1 to 4, i going from 1 to 4, I simply put right in there. I proceed similarly for epsilon y y. Now, of course, I'm talking about the v displacements, which are stored after the u displacements. That's why I'm looking here at the second column, the last column. And here we have del h1 del s because we are talking about the derivative with respect to y or with respect to s, which is the same thing. So here we have the entries for the epsilon ss part. Now for the strain part, we are talking del u del y or del u del uh, s, del v del x, del v del r. And all we have to do now is take this term and put it right in there and take this term and put it right in there. Uh, and then the last row here gives us the sharing, this sharing strain. So this is our B matrix for the special 2 by 2 element. Uh, it is constructed in a very simple way. Uh, the HI, of course, are known. And if we had 5 or 6 or 7 nodes, we would proceed in exactly the same way. All we would have to do is include, of course, additional columns in the B matrix uh, that would give us the appropriate entries for the strains generated by the additional nodal point displacements. 
Let us now look how we can generalize these concepts to the element that is not anymore in the physical x and y space, a uh, 2 by 2 element. In the physical x and y space, this element, a 4 noted element now, might look as shown here. However, what we do is we still deal with the R and S coordinate system embedded on the element where R and S are 1 here, R minus 1, S plus 1 here, R and S both minus 1 here, R plus 1 here, and S minus 1. So in the natural coordinate space, the RS space, we still have a 2 by 2 element. Uh, the H, the interpolation of the displacements, therefore, the interpolation of the displacements, even for the distorted element, is exactly still as shown here, provided, of course, we are entering orbits with the appropriate R and S. H1 is a function of R and S. So if we look at a point in the general element, if we look at a point in the general element, here, for example, such a point, of course, that point has a specific R and S value. And if we want to find the displacement at that point, well, we would have to put the R and S value of that point into H1, H2, H3, H4, and that gives us then the displacements at that point in terms of the nodal point displacements. So the displacement interpolation for this element can still be done in the R and S space. However, difficulties arise, or additional considerations, I should say, rather, arise when we talk about strains, because the physical strains that we have to deal with are, of course, derivatives with respect to x and y, and not R and S anymore. Well, so what we have to do is use a Jacobian transformation. What we want are the derivatives with respect to x and y. What we can find easily are derivatives with respect to r and s on the displacements, because the displacements are given in terms of r and s uh, value. So remember, u is equal to sum of i h i u i and the hi, of course, is a function of r and s, so we can directly find derivatives with respect to r and s of u. What we cannot find easily are derivatives with respect to x. This is the relationship that we use. It gives us a transformation from derivatives of x and y to derivatives r and s. A question must immediately be in your mind, why do we not write down directly this relationship, which is given by the chain rule. If we want del, del del x of displacements, why not just use del del x being equal to del del r, del r del x, and so on? Well, the difficulty is that we cannot find del r del x very easily. We have x being the function of h i x i. This is the interpolation which we have to use now I mentioned earlier on the first slide that we're interpolating displacements and coordinates in the same way. So here we have a linear interpolation of the coordinates from this node to that node and in between here too. So we're using this interpolation here on the coordinates and we can easily find del x del r, but we cannot easily find del r del x. We would have to invert this relationship somehow so that we have r in terms of x. Well, it is easier, therefore, to write this relationship down, which is really the chain rule. This is also the chain rule, the chain rule the other way around, which gives del r del, del, del r being equal to del del x del x del r plus del del y del y del r if we multiply this out. And it's this relationship that we can use effectively. Well, this relationship in three-dimensional analysis, of course, would involve a third row and third column. In one-dimensional analysis, we only talk about a one-by-one. One. Uh, in other words, in one-dimensional analysis for a truss, we just have that entry. Uh, in general, we can write it in this way, where J is the Jacobian transformation from the X, Y, Z coordinate system to the R, S, T coordinate system. And since we want, of course, these derivatives, because these derivatives give us 
give us actual strains, we have to invert this relationship. Uh, having constructed then these derivatives in terms of these derivatives, which we can find just as we have done before, we can now establish the B matrix in much the same way as earlier. Uh, and since we now have H and B matrices for an element, of course these are a function of R, S, and T, uh, we would perform the integration and now I'm referring to the integration of the stiffness matrix. Remember K is equal to B transpose C B over the volume. Now notice that since the B matrix that we're using in here is a function of R and S in a two-dimension analysis, and R runs from minus 1 to plus 1, and S runs from minus 1 to plus 1, we now have to use a transformation also on dV to integrate over the Rs volume and that integration and that dV element then is expressed as shown here and that of course is given to us from uh, uh, mathematical analysis. So basically what we are saying here is that we are replacing this integral over the physical volume by an integral minus 1 to plus 1, minus 1 to plus 1, uh, and that signifies from minus 1 to plus 1 over R and over S. If we had a three-dimensional analysis, we would have another uh, integral sign here, B transpose now R and S, function of R and S, C, B, function of R and S, and then our dV now in terms of R and S. So this is how we really do things. And remember this dV here, this dV is that one there. The, this integration is effectively performed, is, perfect, is effectively, excuse me, is effectively performed uh, uh, using numerical integration. Uh, and I will discuss that uh, later on. Let's look once at the Jacobian transformation for some very simple examples that uh, this Jacobian transformation for some very simple examples just to make things a little clearer. In this case, we really have taken our 2 by 2 element and we have stretched it into the x and y axes. That stretching is giving us a 3 here and a 2 there because our 2 by 2 element has a length of 2 here and 6 divided by uh, 2 gives us 3. Similarly here we have stretched the element by a factor of 2. Of course this relationship here is in general calculated, the J is in general calculated as shown here. And the result of that by putting these interpolations into there is this value are these values here. Physically, what these mean is a stretching, in this particular case, into the x and y axes. Uh, uh, somewhat a case where we cannot directly, well, not easily directly write down the J uh, matrix is this one. Here we would go through the actual evaluation uh, the way I have indicated it. In other words, we would go through this actual evaluation, substituting from here and, of course, for y also. And this would be the result. Notice that we now have a stretching here of 3, uh, compression from a 2 length to a 1 length. Therefore, we have a 1 half here. And there's also an angle change, and that gives us the off diagonal element here. Uh, another interesting case here, as an example, we have the same length here to same length here, but a distortion in the element because uh, this node 2 has come down from there to its midpoint. And the resulting Jacobian is given here. Now notice that that Jacobian is a function of R and S. So the inverse, which is used in the construction of the B matrix, would also be a function of R and S. A particularly interesting case is 
the one where we shift nodes to advantage. See, here we have our original, our three-noded element that we talked about already in the R space now. It's a truss element. And let's say that in our actual physical space, we have this node there, the th three node there, and the two nodes there. The, elements in, the element in the actual physical space has a length of L. We have taken this node and shifted it to the quarter point of the element, to the quarter point of the element. What I will show you right now is that by having done so, by having taken this node from its midpoint and shifted over in the actual physical space to the quarter point, we will find that the strain has a singularity here of 1 over square root x. This is a very important point which uh, can be used in the analysis of fracture problems because we know that in the analysis of fracture problems we have a 1 over square root x singularity at a, at a cracked tip. And if we want to predict the actual stress there or the displacements around the cracked tip, it can be of advantage to use this fact, shifting nodes to quarter points, in order to capture the stress singularity more accurately. Well, let me show you then how this strain or stress singularity uh, comes about. If we look at this element here and we use our interpolation on the coordinates, this would be the result. Now, notice that uh, we have substituted, of course, the xi values here. x1 is 0, x2 is l, x3 is l over 4. We have substituted those values and directly come up with this result. Well, we can see that this indeed is true. Let's put r equal to plus 1 in. In other words, the right-hand side node uh, for the right-hand side node, and we would have a 2 here squared, gives us 4, goes out with that 4, so at r equal plus 1, we have x equal to l, which is correct, of course. Let's put r equal to minus 1 in, we find x is equal to 0. Let's put r equal to uh, 0 in, we find x is equal to l over 4. In other words, this has been a simple check on that we have the right interpolation, geometry interpolation, for this element. Our j now is simply del x del r. x is given here. If we take the differentiation of that, we get the 2 in front. It gives l over 2 times 1 plus r, this value here, in other words. Uh, then our b matrix is constructed by the inverse of the j that is this one, to times the r derivatives of the interpolation functions. Of course, here we talk only about one strain. Remember, in the truss, the only displacement of concern is the u displacement, and of course, the strain is simply epsilon xx, a strain into this direction also. Uh, well, this is our B matrix then. And if we take our h1, 2, and 3, and we differentiate these, as indicated here with respect to r, we directly obtain these functions here. If we now recognize that since we have x related to r here, we can, of course, also invert this relationship. We can write r in terms of x. And if we have done so, we can take that relationship and put it right in here. Then we would get b in terms of x. And that's what I have done here. The first uh, line shows simply r in terms of x now. And I've substituted that r value into the b matrix. And this is the result. Notice that we have a strain singularity. This, of course, is the first element here. Uh, the next element, this is here the next element in the B matrix. And that is the third element in the B matrix. Notice that we have in 
this element, that one, and that one, the 1 over square root x, which means that we have a 1 over square root x singularity at x equal to 0. Well, this is really, this fact is used very effectively in fracture mechanics analysis. Assume that we have a crack here and that we want to analyze the stress conditions around that crack. What we can do is we use now, of course, two-dimensional elements. This is a plane stress situation. We would put a two-dimensional triangular element there, and we shift these midpoint nodes. This is now very small here, but I s hope you can still follow. We shift these midpoint nodes to the quarter point, just the way we have been doing it here. We're putting the third node to the quarter point, and the result is that at this crack tip, we have a 1 over square root x singularity. And uh, using, using this element layout. And of course, we know that in fact, there, should, there is a 1 over square root x singularity in linear fracture mechanics analysis. And, uh, uh, and so this is an effective way of capturing this singularity. And, uh, uh, has been used or is currently being used very abundantly in practice. The important point that I wanted to make really is that we can shift nodes in the element to our advantage. But we really do that in specific applications such as fracture mechanics. In general, in general, we will see later when I talk about modeling of fine element systems, in general, it is most effective to leave the mid-side nodes at their physical midpoints. In other words, for an eight-noded element, two-dimensional analysis, we would put this mid-node in the physical space also actually at the midpoint. We would not shift it. Then the element has good convergence characteristics into all directions, and this is really how the element is used uh, most effectively for general applications. However, in specific applications, such as fracture mechanics analysis, it can be of advantage to shift these mid-side nodes uh, to pick up certain strain or stress singularities that we know do exist. Now, on the last transparency that I wanted to show you, I wanted to indicate uh, something to you that I will be talking about in uh, later lectures uh, more abundantly, namely the fact that we're using numerical integration. B for the K matrix, as an example, is once again now a function of R and S. Of course, this part here is also a function of R and S. So we have here a function of R and S. And we have here also a function of R and S. So this F matrix here is a function of R and S. Notice that the B also includes the inversion of the J, the Jacobian matrix. It includes the inversion of the J because we had to construct the, del, the X and Y and Z derivatives from the R, S, and T derivatives. So what we, can, what we do in practical analysis is that we use numerical integration to evaluate the K matrix. I've indicated that here schematically. If you look at this element here, what we do is we evaluate the F matrix. This is a matrix. In two-dimensional analysis, we would only run over I and J. I is this direction, J is that direction. In three-dimensional analysis, which is in general, analysis, we run i, j, and k this way. We evaluate the F matrix here at specific points, r, s, and t, t now being this axis, and then multiply that F matrix by certain weight constants and sum these contributions over all i, j, and k in order to obtain an accurate enough approximation to the actual stiffness matrix. Of course, the, act, the order of approximation 
with which we obtain the uh, actual stiffness matrix, or rather, how closely the numerically calculated stiffness matrix approximates the actual stiffness matrix depends on, number one, how many integration points we are using and what kind of integration scheme we are using. Uh, these points here correspond to the Gauss numerical integration. In this case, for two-dimensional analysis, we would use a two-by-two two integration. In other words, I and J would both run from one to two. K is not applicable, and we would have altogether four evaluations of the Fs here. Multiply each of them by weighting factors, which have been derived for us by Gauss some long time ago. And uh, uh, summing up these contributions gives us a close enough approximation to the K matrix. Of course, the question of how many points we have to use, what integration scheme we should use, is a very important one. We must use enough integration points to get a close enough approximation to the actual stiffness matrix, and I will be addressing those questions in a later lecture. This is all I wanted to say in this lecture. Thank you very much for your attention.